Wow, thank you all so much for coming. This is really exciting. Um, Psalm 71.15 says, My mouth will tell everyone about your righteous deeds and your saving acts all day long, though I cannot sum them up. I do not know how to glorify God a little bit. (laughs) So strap in because you're about to get a drink from a fire hydrant. Okay. Um, Like many of us, I have a past that all refer to as the thirsty pieces of me. But um, there's just not time tonight to waste on the past. We've got souls to talk about. So um, I'll try to sum it up in one sentence. I was an orphaned, runaway teen mom who became a bankrupt, bulimic divorcee addicted to love. (laughs) Um, Also known as um, the woman at the well. I just shaved 35 years off my presentation. I'm getting better at this already. Um, but seriously, uh, I was a sinner that, that needed Jesus, and now I'm a sinner that has Jesus. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Any others of us out there? <laughs> well, you just qualified yourself to come up here next year. <laughs> but seriously, um, Like the woman at the well, I was truly a captive to my desires, and he freed me. He showed me that I needed to make him sovereign in my heart, and I decided to be completely sold out for him. Um, Three years ago, this very day, um, I recommitted my life to the Lord along with my son, and we were baptized here at Crossroads. To think that three years later, this is where I'd be standing is unbelievable for me, but believable with our Lord. Um, When the Lord had given uh, the Samaritan woman his living water, she left her water jar and ran to tell others about the Lord, and many believed. In similar fashion, on my 35th birthday, I did a public confession on social media about my relationship addiction and my new commitment to Christ. This led to inspiring many who had been struggling in the same way. A few months later, Crossroads kicked off the Above and Beyond campaign. Now, up until this point, I had been in one financial turmoil after another. I was forced into bankruptcy and had never tithed in my life. Um, I had a bad taste in my mouth for about churches wanting money, and as a single mom of two, I needed every cent that I had and didn't have for that matter, but I didn't know. Christ the way that I know him now. I didn't, I didn't understand. And so when I decided to be completely sold out for him, I realized I probably couldn't be considered sold out if I couldn't obey and tithe. So um, the Holy Spirit started working on me. Um, I about had a heart attack when I calculated what 10% would be. (laughs) When I did the calculation on paper with my budget, I was negative $500 a month. Um, This was not something that could work by just not eating out on Fridays um, or something like that. This was huge. If I did this and survived, there would be no question that God made this happen. Um, by the end of the campaign, I had this desire that I wanted to take this risk. I read Malachi 3.10 where the Lord said to test him in this, and he will open the floodgates to provide for you. So I wanted to be a case study. On Commitment Sunday, I walked with my 10% commitment envelope and tossed it in the boat. My heart was full of joy, excitement, and yet that peace that passes understanding that he was going to show me his power. Right on the cusp of that pivotal moment, just a week later, the kids and I attended our first ICOM, um, the International Conference on Missions. It was, ICOM is like a mission candy store if you haven't had the opportunity to go. Um, Our eyes were open, though, to the anguish and affliction around the world and the thousands of people in bondage and suffering from abuse and poverty, but most importantly, those who do not know who Jesus is. For years, I felt God tapping me on my shoulder to go into mission, but Satan would plant seeds of doubt. 
I knew the Lord had us at ICOM for a reason, and we were prayerfully waiting to find out why. At ICOM, we met this organization, the Toga Christian Mission, and um, they friended me on Facebook and ended up reading my public confession about my relationship addiction and sent me a private message inviting me to come to Togo in West Africa to share my story and testimony of learning to make God my first love and put him first in my life um, with the women of Togo who faced two options for provision, one, to marry into polygamy, or two, to prostitute themselves. Um, None of them knew there was an option to just lean on the Lord for provision. And so um, on our own, traveling out of the country for the first time, (laughs) we arrived safely in Vogue and Togo in West Africa. Both my children and I were able to serve in various branches of ministry, Where voodoo and demon possession exist openly, the Lord protected us. Um, When we returned, I praised God because my son made a decision to attend Ozark Christian College as an intercultural missions major. Um, And I returned to my insurance cubicle. I have been working in commercial insurance for 14 years, yet I was more at home and purposeful for those two weeks on the mission field than I have ever been in the 14 years sitting at my desk. I didn't understand why the Lord brought me back. Um, Then the Lord started having me share my testimony from Africa, and I started seeing people getting so inspired. Um, People were moving and beginning to serve as a family. Children and single women were volunteering. They were seeing that no matter your past or who you are or where you are at in your life, the Lord can use you. Um, So I was like, now I know why you brought me back here, Lord, to share this testimony and to engage the church. So um, I began praying for a hybrid role that would allow me to go to the nations, but then come back and engage the American church. This is where the Lord gave me another opportunity to step out of the boat. He has answered that prayer, and Praise God, I will be joining Team Expansion as a Project Fulfillment Specialist. Um, Now, before I share with you all the exciting things that I'll be doing, let me first give you a quick snapshot of who Team Expansion is. For those of you that don't know, um, Crossroads, um, through our ministry team uh, budget, we've actually um, started partnering with team expansion two or three years ago. I'm not sure how long ago, but um, um, we already um, send them a portion of our missions budget. And so um, it's just very awesome that here now I'm actually joining someone that we've already been partnering with. Um, But anyway, um, just, yeah, sorry, just to tell you about um, a little bit about team expansion. Um, they partner with the global church to mobilize, train, and coach qualified believers in starting church planning movements. So um, I'm just going to kind of rapid fire some of their history and how they got to where they're at now. Um, They began as a prayer movement on the campus of then Kentucky Christian College in 1978. Um, In 1982, five missionaries headed to Uruguay to start the very first team expansion work. In 1983, their international services department, um, this is the stateside support team for all the international workers, um, it was launched and headquartered in Cincinnati, Ohio. Between 85 and 96, team expansion launched multiple new teams, including Venezuela, Ukraine, Ireland, and Tanzania. By 1997, Team Expansion, um, I'm sorry, in 1997, Team Expansion was invited to move its headquarters to Louisville, Kentucky. And by June of that year, there were 120 full-time missionaries working around the world with 22 different people groups. Teams continue to go into some of the most cutting-edge places, including Bosnia and Kosovo. In 2001, there were 199 full-time missionaries, including three brand new works in Italy, Japan, and Louisville, Kentucky, where the workers focused on a huge Hispanic population. A year later, more than 8,000 people had come to Christ, and more than 110 churches had been planted around the world. 
Currently, there are 350 full-time adult missionaries with over 200 children of their own in 46 countries and 70 church planning projects. So far, Team Expansion has planted 350 churches with over 12,400 baptisms. In 2014 alone, they had 1,387 baptisms, 130 churches planted, and 17,446 in attendance. On average, every team expansion worker or family has at least 200 prayer warriors who have joined them in regular intercession for their ministry. So, as you can see, God has brought an astounding number of people together for a very specific purpose to accomplish very exciting things for his glory. They do this through seven great passions and core values. The two that truly stood out for me that set them apart from many other organizations is first that they bathe every thought and action in prayer and that the churches that are planted are among the unreached people groups. Unreached people groups are nations of souls that have less than 2% known Christians and no viable church in place. These are nations that have no way of hearing about the salvation through Jesus. Currently, there's approximately 6,900 unreached people groups, and 1,500 of those groups have a population of more than 100,000. That's 2 to 3 billion people and over two-thirds of the world's population. So why is this important? Well, first, um, meeting the needs of the poor. Most of the unreached people groups are in remote places where people are poor and life is difficult, which is one of the reasons why they're unreached. Um, so in these cases, the poorest of the poor physically are also the poorest of the poor spiritually. And obviously, eternal destiny demands it. As we all know, no one comes to the Father but through Jesus Christ. And lastly, because Jesus commanded it. Um, obviously, we all know the Great Commission as well as many other places in his word where he has called us to go to the nations and make disciples and spread the good news. This alone was enough to motivate me, but reading Matthew 24, 14 made it my priority. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached through the whole world so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come. So how do you reach two to three billion people? There's a saying that asks the question, how do you eat an elephant? Does anyone know the answer? The common answer is one bite at a time. That's to help you break it down so it's not overwhelming, chip away at it. But if the goal is simply to eat the elephant, then maybe the better answer would be to invite the village to dinner. <laughs> uh, team expansion does this in a couple of ways. One is to form teams from individual volunteers to go plant churches. So, you know, like me, for instance, I could have gone and said, okay, you know, I want to go permanently um, internationally to um, a team that's planning a church. And they would just match me up with a team and send us. We could be from all over, not know each other, but we would all be joined together to create a team and go out to plant a church among, among an unreached people group. The other way that they do that is through the PACE program. My part in the global ministry of team expansion is going to be focused mostly on the PACE program. PACE stands for Pray, Activate, Commit, and Enlist. It's the name given to the program that connects existing churches, most often here in the U.S., with unreached people groups. The goal is to introduce the church to an unreached group and have them eventually support and run that entire field with their own people. This approach was inspired by the example of Nehemiah. He had a goal to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Each group was not only responsible for the portion of the wall that bordered their own living space, but also adopted one of the distant sections of the wall that was in a remote area with no bordering residents, all working together as one body for a common goal. My role as a project fulfillment specialist would be to make that happen by acting as a liaison with these churches and walking them through the some 
50 steps of the process of praying for guidance on which people group to sponsor, establishing leadership for the project within the church, planning and leading vision trips to their chosen field, strategizing long-term plans for the church to be involved in that field, and eventually raising up and sending missionaries from within their church to be pioneers in this group of completely Christless people. So I'll give you a quick snapshot of conception to fruition of the process that I'll be supporting step by step. First, prayer, of course. Again, one of their core values. It's one of their great passions. Um, it is how team expansion was born, and we believe fervently in the power of bold, persistent prayer. It's where everything should start. Um, They pray for the world, uh, the unreached, their church, and the leading of the Spirit in selecting a group. Next, they need to share the vision. This is where they're going to activate the congregation and empower their church leaders to take ownership of the project and get buy-in. After that, they're going to choose a people group. Through the leading of the Spirit, they'll be selecting a group and committing unwaveringly to bringing them Jesus no matter the obstacles. Next, they will take a survey trip or what's also called a vision walk or a prayer walk. Um, They'll take a trip to the chosen people, and this is... Another area where I'll be um, helping and acting as a liaison and sometimes even leading these trips out there. I'll be joining them out on these survey trips um, to the chosen people to learn about them, learn the language, pray over the area, survey, um, do some preliminary strategizing on how and where God wants the church. Next, they create a master plan. This includes timelines, goals, strategizing based on what you've learned, what we've learned um, to put a church planning movement um, in place there. Next, they train um, the workers that um, they have raised up. Um, they go through training um, through with their church through courses, webinars, working with um, me and the other um, project fulfillment specialists and the others on the team um, to utilizing any of the resources that they can to equip themselves and connecting with other churches that have done what they're doing. Next, they actually send the workers um, to the people group and begin sharing the good news and discipling new believers. After that, um, it's the gathering phase of believers. So it's teaching um, those that do believe how to disciple other believers. Um, At this point, and of course there's a lot of time in between each of these, but at this point um, the church, um, the Pace Church that went there to help plan it, now starts to take more of a backseat or passenger role and allow the nationals to begin leading, giving them ownership and authority, and just support being more of a supportive role. And ideally, um, the church finally reaches a stage where they are self-sustaining, self-governed by nationals from that nation and discipling others to begin planning new churches on their own. And so that's where the Pace Church would then disengage and um, then go to the next unreached people group that the Lord has called them to. So, for example, this church is in Kherson, Ukraine. It started with a Pace Church out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, Now that the, the church that they planted is completely run by nationals and has planted 42 different churches of their own and sent out missionaries to local Muslim communities. That's thousands of souls saved that began with one church stepping out of their boat. Another church had done a couple of short-term trips to India and also Haiti. They were overwhelmed at learning there were over 2,000 unreached people groups in India alone and felt led to join the PACE program and implement a viable church among one of the unreached people groups there. Through her prayer and networking phase of the project, she shared her vision with a pastor from Haiti that she had previously served with. I love this part. This is exciting for me. 
I was able to be on a webinar with the pastor from Haiti who shared that he had no idea that there were so many unreached people groups in India. He explained that in Haiti, they have religious freedom, but his heart broke for those in India that did not and wanted to go see this for himself, and so he did. Upon returning, he joined uh, the PACE program with that girl that, re that shared the vision with him as their partner to help implement a viable church in India. So through the PACE program, a pastor from a third world country is now the missionary. Until now, many church plants have been done by the caste system or social status. Um, now that we are reaching out to people groups as a whole, they're expressing that it has restored their dignity because they're no longer identified as their social class. All of the churches that have committed to embrace an unreached people group have been all different sizes, some small, some large. Yet during the time they have engaged in the PACE program, their memberships have doubled and tripled. So it's not a hindrance to the church. It's actually growing the church body back home. At the same time, it's spreading the news and, and multiplying churches abroad. Obviously, this program has amazing fruit and potential, but it's not a sprint. It's definitely a marathon. It can take two to 30 years to get to that disengage um, phase of the project. Um, the Lord doesn't look to hire hired help like mercenaries. There's nothing biblical about that. He looks directly to us as one church body and tells us to go make disciples of all nations. Disciples. Not just go make believers, but go make disciples. Multiplying believers, disciples, and churches. So now with this unique calling, I will have the honor to be working with multiple churches at a time, reaching some 30 nations all at once. Um, Team Expansion has a goal to start 80 church planning movements by 2015, and there's currently 45 teams out there trying to make that happen. While I will not be moving permanently out of the country right now, I will still need to move my family from Overland Park to Louisville, Kentucky to join the International Services Department at Emerald Hills. Emerald Hills, which is pictured here, is Team Expansion's 61-acre campus. It's located just outside of Louisville, Kentucky. It's home to Team Expansion's office staff and International Services Department. The staff works to mobilize, train, as well as sustain the cross-cultural workers, as well as educate and equip churches and ministry partners. Additionally, Emerald Hill serves as the home base and refuge for Team Expansion's 350 workers. It has miles of prayer trails and shelters through the woods and rope courses for team building. It's a prayer retreat and learning center. I will be rubbing shoulders every single day with missionaries that will be going all over the world. I know at some point the Lord will have me permanently overseas, and I yearn for that day. I could go now if I wanted, but I know, and I do, <laughs> but I um, I know that the Lord has called me to this right now. However, that desire and passion for reaching the unreached is what is needed for me to succeed in this position to engage the church. I will be stationed in Kentucky, but traveling to each of the Pace Church plants around the world, like I mentioned, to help lead the vision trips, to pray over and survey the area, and strategize the long-term plan for implementing these church plants. Um, these are usually two-week trips, since each phase of the project can take some time, only one or two of the projects will be at the traveling phase in any given year. The rest of the time, I'll be supporting the churches through all of the other steps of the projects and planning phases. Like any other missionary, this requires support. I am responsible for my own salary to provide for me and my children, my own benefits, insurance, retirement, and all of my business ministry expenses from the cost of travel to the pen and paper I use. Um, I have to be 100% funded before I can go. I've been told this can take one to two years to raise funds for this position. While I was in training, um, I was sitting there with missionaries that were going all over the world to very dangerous places um, that are, quite honestly, just 
filthy, they're dangerous, they, um, there's persecution and, you know, places where Christians um, lose their lives on the field. Yet, amazingly, they had that peace that passes understanding. None of them had any fear whatsoever of the places that they were going to be going into, these closed countries. And I was so inspired by that. And then we got to the part where we were learning about raising support. <laughs> and you could just see fear wash over everyone's face. <laughs> and I was thinking, oh, you know, that's, that's, that shouldn't be the case. Like, we should never be afraid of asking someone to get on board with this, for giving someone the opportunity to be obedient and to reach out and, and save souls, to be a part of saving lives. What else on this earth could be more important and um, not only that, but the Lord blesses those that bless others. And that's why he blesses us, is to bless others. So um, I was thinking about that and also um, thinking, prayerfully considering the mountain ahead of me in raising my own support. And I looked back over the last two years of my above and beyond case study in God's provision. Before I started tithing, I was paycheck to paycheck. The only bills that got paid were the ones that screamed the loudest or threatened disconnect. After I started tithing, every month, every bill was paid. I can't explain it. It's a God factor. <laughs> Some bills would be less than normal, but he would provide in several ways. We may have been down to a few dollars in our account, but everything was paid, and we had food in a home. So about halfway through the first year of tithing, seeing the Lord work a miracle every month and showing me that it was about growing my faith and not about money at all, I lost my child support. <laughs> this took my budget from negative $500 a month to negative $900 per month. Technically, I was, you know, hemming and hawing about I could technically reduce because my income has decreased, so that means my 10% has decreased. And... I was like, no, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with this and just allow the Lord to show his power. So I kept it the same. And the Lord continued to stretch my little, not into a lot, but into enough. I have several testimonies after I started tithing where it looked like I had a financial problem come my way, but the Lord would rescue me just in time and reward my faith. A car that wouldn't start, that I had to get rid of as junk, but the day the buyer came, it started, so I sold it for more money. The title to the car was stuck in my bankruptcy, and I had been trying to get it for years, and it came a week before the city required me to get rid of the car. I called different services for a lower monthly fee and was given more than I asked for. The Lord provided us $10,000 in three months to go to Africa. We were able to get visas and passports in record-breaking time. I received a promotion. I could go on and on. After we returned from Africa, one of the families we met there hit some financial difficulty. They were a family of seven, and the husband lost his job. They needed someone to support them for one year. The Togo Christian Mission asked me to ask around and be praying for a supporter, but the Lord put it on my heart to support them as soon as they told me. They said a family of seven needs $75 a month to live. Not only was that convicting to me in my own monthly need, but I felt led to give $100 a month to help him have extra to start his own business. This put my budget at negative $1,000 per month. The Lord provided enough for me to support the family of seven at $100 per month for the entire year, as well as myself and my two children. This was all to grow my faith because the Lord knew that he was going to call me to team expansion and put it on my heart to do something bold. Here's where it gets even more exciting. I am going to be the only single mom with a child at home um, with team expansion. So already I'm going to be kind of a trailblazer, you know, breaking the mold of the typical <laughs> missionary and um, and helping others to see that, again, no matter who you are and where you are in life, the Lord has called you. Nobody gets to sit on the bench. Everybody has been called. Um, as Jeff would say, everybody gets a trophy. <laughs> but um, just thinking back to those in my class and my case study of God's provision, I asked the Lord, 
Lord, what can I do to turn even my fundraising into a ministry? What can I do to take a bold leap of faith to allow you alone to work and show your presence and power to glorify you and give future missionaries that I'll be rubbing shoulders with every day that same peace in your provision? Well, when I told someone what the Lord had put it on my heart to do, they said, you're burning your ship. And I was like, what is that? And so I Googled, Googled it, and um, many great historic con conquerors like Alexander the Great and Hernan Cortez would actually burn their own ships when they were facing impossible odds in battle for the sole purpose to eradicate any notion of retreat from the minds of their troops and commit themselves unwaveringly to the cause of victory. Defeat was not an option, and every time they would win. So I have burned my boat. <laughs> the Lord um, put it on my heart to sell my house, quit my job uh, before I raised full support, and continue to raise support full time so that I can move to Louisville, not in a year or two, but this summer before the beginning of the school year so that Bella can start fifth grade in Kentucky. I know with full faith that he will make this happen. In order to do that, though, like I said, I have to raise 100% of support. Um, through your prayers and partnership, the Lord has already provided 41%. I still need to raise 59% in the next couple of months. This is actually impossible for me, but easy for God. But it's going to take a lot of prayer. If you've already joined my prayer team, you know that I send out a weekly update sharing the amazing things God has done because of your prayers and the new prayers that are needed. Um, here is what the Lord has done through your prayers. My baby grand sold in 24 hours to an awesome family right here at Crossroads. Um, I had my house for sale for seven weeks and not a single person had come to look at it. I sent my first prayer letter to my prayer team and a week later I had a buyer. Our house needed to be painted <laughs> to pass inspections, and the Lord provided 70-degree weather in February, and several people that at a last-minute's notice came to paint my house in the dark. <laughs> my title cleared from bankruptcy. He provided faithful friends and family to work alongside me tirelessly um, and help me move and provide a place to store my remaining possessions, as well as a place to live until I'm fully funded. I had an extremely profitable moving sale, and um, this, this is Bella saying goodbye to the house. <laughs> um, the Lord provided enough from the sale of the house, the sale of most of my possessions, and my tax return to not only pay off my bankruptcy, that I have been paying for seven years, but also paid off my car. For the first time in my entire life, I am debt free. <laughs> and of course, not just earthly debt, but spiritual debt as well. And that's what this is all about. And, um, of course, he did that just two weeks before I quit my job and two months before I go permanently to the mission field. I still have escrow money coming and a bonus check on my last day of work. This will provide me enough to pay off the remaining amount of my above and beyond commitment. So I'm really excited about that. Um, the Lord literally performed a miracle like the fishes and loaves. It went from not enough to everything I needed plus extra. He truly opened the floodgates. I no longer have need for money, only faith. Currently, I have a prayer team of 112, which is amazing, but we need more prayers. I have been attending Crossroads, as Brad mentioned, for around 10 years now, off and on, but um, faithfully the last few years. And the Lord freed me when I was a captive in my sin. And then he used this church to transform my thirsty heart into a quenched heart for mission. He used the Above and Beyond campaign to transform me and my faith. While God gave the increase, I am a symbol of the fruits of your labor. 
and I want Crossroads as the spiritual head over me. I am honored, so honored, that you will be my sending church and continue in this journey with me. So thank you so much for all of your support um, in, in many different ways. You have supported our family in this calling. So I just thank you for that. Um, we could not do this without you. God had asked me to do something bold, and so I'm asking each of you sitting here tonight to do something bold by stepping out of the boat and commit to pray boldly and persistently for the needs of this calling to reach the unreached nations. This also gives me an opportunity to be praying for your needs as well. You can do this in two ways. There's a table with a couple of laptops over there um, that will allow you to sign up electronically right now. Um, or at your tables, you'll see um, some prayer commitment cards that you can write your name and email address on and place in the connection card baskets at the entrance. Um, but I also want to challenge you to boldly step out of the boat and answer the call that the Lord has commanded of all of us to spread the good news. If you ever want to know how you can do that, please let the staff here at Crossroads know, or even me, I would be honored to help you prayerfully learn what the Lord is calling you to do. Thank you all so much for coming and letting me share and for all your wonderful prayers. You are so important, and like I said, we cannot do this without you. Um, at this time, I'd like to take the next five minutes or so or longer if we need and open it up um, for questions. After that, we will close with a special event. So, any questions? I wasn't supposed to do that. <laughs> Will you pause that for a second? <laughs> Thanks. Anybody have any questions I can answer? I know, I just threw out a lot of information. Yes, Mr. Fogo. An unreached people group um, would not be what you would consider like a political country where there's political boundaries. An unreached people group would be a nation of people. So for instance, right here in Shawnee, we have many nations that could be residing right here. Um, so it wouldn't be necessarily a political country, but it would be a nation of people. So there are many, many tribes and several different nationalities all over the world that have been identified yet have no viable church in place, no way of knowing who Jesus is, and have less than 2% known Christians among them. Does that answer? Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, if you think of any, um, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, Whenever you um, sign up for the prayer team, you'll have my email address. Feel free to reach out to me at any time. Um, Tamika can also provide my email address for you if you just want to email me any questions. I'd be happy to do that. Um, in closing, I have um, a, special, a special event that um, I would love to have you join me in doing. Um, among those 6,900 unreached people groups, Team Expansion has identified the 25 least reached of the unreached. And so tonight, you'll find on your table um, flyers that identify these unreached nations. Each table has at least has a couple of, um, of these people groups that have been identified. Um, it provides facts and um, just an, a, a quick snapshot about the people and um, what their needs are, what, what we need to pray about to be able to penetrate and reach that nation. Um, so some of them you might be surprised. Um, I think there's actually uh, one of the groups is right in Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> and they are one of the least reached people groups out of the 6,900 right in Detroit, Michigan. So um, I'll take that as an opportunity to let you know that 
you know, while, while yes, we need to go to the nations outside of our country, there are also unreached peoples right here that we're rubbing shoulders with every day. We just need to be praying boldly for an opportunity and the words to speak and that the Lord will be preparing their hearts. Um, but it does take um, us taking that step out of the boat and, and praying for the Lord to lead us. So um, I would really encourage you to do that. So um, at this time, you're going to be seeing, um, seeing the 25 least reached of the unreached scrolling up on the screen. And during that time, I'd like to ask each table to take the flyers that you have and take the next 10 minutes to be praying over these nations. You can do that together. You can do that out loud. You can do it silently. Whatever you feel led to do, do that. Proclaim Jesus in their hearts. Pray that whatever they are turning to right now, that it will be ineffective, that they will become dissatisfied with whatever they're turning to for um, comfort, for deliverance, and their, their empty beliefs and their idols. Um, pray that they would have dreams and visions of the Lord. Pray that um, the Lord would raise up workers, actual boots on the ground that will go to these remote of the remotest places and, um, and to reach these people. Um, there are so many things that we can pray for right here. And when we do that, it's a direct link to the power of the Lord and to that nation. And so I encourage you to take this opportunity and allow the Holy Spirit to work through us, to intercede for us, and to reach these nations. So thank you for joining me tonight.